Thanks for joining me again as we dive back into another great classic film. This is a film adapted from a classic work of literature, which tells a powerful story of survival during the Depression. It stars great actors who put in magnificent performances. It is the work of one of the all-time great directors and is shot in magnificent black and white. It is widely considered one of the greatest films of all time. It is The Grapes of Wrath from 1940. Adapted from John Steinbeck's 1939 Pulitzer Prize winning novel of the same name, the screenplay was written by Nunnally Johnson and executive producer was Daryl F. Sanek. The book was America's bestseller of 1939, it won the National Book Award and in 1962 the Nobel Prize Committee cited it as one of the main reasons for granting Steinbeck the Nobel Prize for Literature. It is ranked amongst the 100 greatest English language novels of all time by Time Magazine, The Daily Telegraph and The Modern Library. Banks and the large farming corporations who controlled most Californian farms at the time didn't like the original novel and were even less keen about the film. The Associated Farmers of California called for a boycott of all 20th century Fox films and Steinbeck himself received death threats. Daryl F. Zanuck paid $100,000 for the rights to the novel, with Steinbeck only permitting the sale provided that the filmmakers were respectful and true to the material. The first part of the film follows the book closely, with the second half and the ending differing significantly from the book ending with the family in a good government camp and with things turning out relatively well. The producers decided to tone down Steinbeck's political references, especially those suggesting workers only wanting a living wage were communists, and descriptions of worker exploitation. The film uses visual imagery to focus on the Joes as a family unit, as opposed to the novel's focus on, the, on man and the land together. In the film, most of the Jode family are either reduced to background characters or to being the focus of only one or two relatively minor scenes. The focus is on Tom, Ma, and to a lesser extent, Jim Casey. Although the script conformed to the provisions of the production code, a number of changes were suggested, including not characterising Muley as insane, rewording references to Rosa Shan's pregnancy, removing a toilet gag about Grandma, uh, eliminating mention of uh, Tulare County, California, and not identifying a town as Pixley, which was notorious for its ill treatment of migrant workers. It was suggested they not show Tom killing the deputy sheriff in self-defence, uh, and removing the words of God and Jesus from Casey's uh, parodying song, Yes Sir, That's My Baby. John Ford was considered an odd choice for director because some believed he was a staunch conservative, and the story had a progressive political perspective. Ford was, however, sympathetic to the unions, despite later in life supporting the likes of Richard Nixon. Many consider this his most sensitive film, given its humanist bent through its focus on jo the Joad family story. Henry Fonda, still struggling to become a big Hollywood star at the time, uh, tried to avoid being a contract player for 20th Century Fox because he wanted the ability to independently choose his own projects. An increasing number of stars at the time were trying to gain such independence. But when the much coveted part of Tom Joad was offered to him, Fonda hesitantly gave in and signed a contract for an eight picture deal because he knew it would be the role of a lifetime. Zanuck knew that Henry Fonda was desperate for the part of Tom Joad, so let him uh, let it be known that he was going to offer the part to Tyrone Power. James Stewart was originally set to play Al, with Walter Brennan as, pa as Par Jode. Bula Bondi uh, tested for the role of Mar Jode and believing that she had the part, bought an old jalopy and moved to Bakersfield, California to live amongst the migrant workers and to res research the role. Bondi was reportedly extremely disappointed at losing the role. Louise Dresser was also considered for the part of Mar Jode. Production began only four weeks after John Ford finished working on Jumps Along the Mohawk, so most of the pre-production work was done by cinematographer Greg Tolland and art directors Richard Day and Mark Lee Kirk, who based the look of the film on a vast array of research photos and documents. Prior to filming, Zanuck sent undercover investigators out to the migrant camps to see if John Steinbeck had been exaggerating about the squalor and unfair treatment meted out, out there. Uh, and he was horrified to discover that, if anything, Stein Steinbeck had actually downplayed what went on in the camps. Production began in October of 1939 and was completed by November, mostly shot on the 20th century Fox lot. Second unit director Otto Brower took a crew to Oklahoma, Arizona, Texas and New Mexico, following the route that the Okies had taken. Brower and his crew filmed doubles in long shot to represent the Joad family and paid $5 a piece to carloads of people actually making the trek to California to represent the film's fictional caravan of migrants. Zanuck was heavily involved in all aspects of the production as he saw it as a personal project. His carefully thought through editing was praised by Nunnally Johnson and Zanuck remains one of the few producers Ford ever praised. Ford banned all makeup and perfume from the set on the grounds that it was not in keeping with the tone of the picture. According to Fonda, 
Ford preferred only one take and little or no rehearsal to catch the most spontaneous moment. For the key climactic final scene between Tom and Ma, Ford led Fonda and Jane Darwell through a, the silent action, preventing them from speaking until they were completely in the moment. It was done in a single take and Fonda said on screen, it was brilliant. John Ford could be difficult to work uh, for. He was hard on John Carradine because of his huge ego uh, and this conflict often produced perfect moments of performance and character. He unmercifully chewed out Frank Darian in order to get the performance he needed for the key scenes. He treated Doris Bowden, who played Rosa Shan, quite badly. After the film wrapped, she said, I was glad I never had to work with him again, yet later in life said he was a superb director. I never saw another director work in a way that was as skilled. Woody Guthrie is believed to have been an uncredited music consultant on the film. The pro-union stance of the film led to both Steinbeck and Ford being investigated by, the, by Congress uh, for pro-communist leanings. Non-US audiences saw the film with a prologue which explained the effects of the Depression and the Oklahoma Dust Bowl. The film premiered in New York and Los Angeles in January of 1940 and was released much more widely in March. Frank Nugent of the New York Times wrote that amongst the many scene, uh, screen adaptions of uh, literature, only a small number could be considered amongst the cinema's masterworks and are likely to be recalled whenever great motion pictures are mentioned. Bosley Crowther named The Grapes of Wrath as one of the best 50 films ever made. The Film Daily ranked The Grapes of Wrath as the second best film of 1940 behind Rebecca. John Steinbeck loved the movie and said that Henry Fonda perfectly encapsulated everything he wanted to convey with his character of Tom Joad. It was nominated for seven Academy Awards with wins for John Ford and Jane Darwell, but not for Henry Fonda who lost out to James Stewart in the Philadelphia story. A decision that surprised even Stewart himself. It picked up wins at the Blue Ribbon Awards, the National Board of Review Awards, the New York Film Critics Circle Awards, and was recognized by the American Film Institute amongst its top 25 films in numerous lists over the years. In 1989, it was one of the first films selected for the preservation in the US National Film Registry. It is one of the 1001 movies you might see before you die. It is included amongst Roger Ebert's great movies list as well. So lots of really good reasons to watch this film. A really important story with historical significance. Shot authentically, using great location footage, a great cast who put in first-rate performances, and probably John Ford's best film, which is shot brilliantly in black and white. So, what I'd suggest you do is that you go to our website, find our virtual screenings page, find the link to this particular film, definitely click on and watch it, it's a wonderful film. Uh, but as always, we'd advise you to come back, let others know your thoughts about the film, and whether you'd recommend it for them as well. And then we're back in the not-too-distant future for our next classic films review. Catch you next time.